Book 7, Chapters 14 and 15 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 2, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston, Book 7, Chapters 14 and 15. Chapter 14. That David made great preparations for the house of God, and that, upon Adonijah's attempt to gain the kingdom, he appointed Solomon to reign. After the delivery of this prophecy, the king commanded the strangers to be numbered, and they were found to be one hundred and eighty thousand. Of these he appointed fourscore thousand to be hewers of stone, and the rest of the multitude to carry the stones, and of them he set over the workmen three thousand and five hundred. He also prepared a great quantity of iron and brass for the work, with many and those exceeding large cedar trees the tyrians and sidonians sending them to him for he had sent to them for a supply of those trees and he told his friends that these things were now prepared that he might leave materials ready for the building of the temple to his son who was to reign after him and that he might not have them to seek then when he was very young and by reason of his age unskilful in such matters, but might have them lying by him, and so might the more readily complete the work. So David called his son Solomon, and charged him, when he had received the kingdom, to build a temple to God, and said, I was willing to build God a temple myself, but he prohibited me because I was polluted with blood and wars. But he hath foretold that Solomon, my youngest son, should build him a temple, and should be called by that name, over whom he hath promised to take the like care as a father takes over his son, and that he would make the country of the Hebrews happy under him, and that not only in other respects, but by giving it peace and freedom from wars and from internal seditions, which are the greatest of all blessings. Since, therefore, says he, thou wast ordained king by God himself, before thou wast born, endeavor to render thyself worthy of this his providence, as in other instances, so particularly in being religious and righteous and courageous. Keep thou also his commands and his laws, which he hath given us by Moses, and do not permit others to break them. Be zealous also to dedicate to God a temple, which he hath chosen to be built under thy reign. Nor be thou affrighted by the vastness of the work, nor set about it timorously, for I will make all things ready before I die. And take notice that there are already ten thousand talents of gold and a hundred thousand talents of silver collected together. I have also laid together brass and iron without number and an immense number of timber and stones. Moreover, thou hast many ten thousand stone cutters and carpenters and if thou shalt want anything further, do thou add somewhat of thine own. Wherefore, if thou performest this work, thou wilt be acceptable to God, and have him for thy patron. David also further exhorted the rulers of the people to assist his son in this building, and to attend to the divine service, when they should be free from all their misfortunes, for that they by this means should enjoy instead of them peace and a happy settlement, 
with which blessings God rewards such men as are religious and righteous. He also gave orders that when the temple should be once built, they should put the ark therein with the holy vessels, and he assured them that they ought to have had a temple long ago if their fathers had not been negligent of God's commands, who had given it in charge, that when they had got the possession of this land, they should build him a temple. Thus did David discourse to the governors and to his son. David was now in years, and his body, by length of time, was become cold and benumbed, insomuch that he could get no heat by covering himself with many clothes and when the physicians came together they agreed to this advice that a beautiful virgin chosen out of the whole country should sleep by the king's side and that this damsel would communicate heat to him and be a remedy against his numbness now there was found in the city one woman of a superior beauty to all other women her name was abishag who sleeping with the king did no more than communicate warmth to him for he was so old that he could not know her as a husband knows his wife but of this woman we shall speak more presently now the fourth son of david was a beautiful young man and tall born to him of haggith his wife he was named adonijah and was in his disposition like to absalom and exalted himself as hoping to be king and told his friends that he ought to take the government upon him he also prepared many chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him when his father saw this he did not reprove him nor restrain him from his purpose nor did he go so far as to ask wherefore he did so now adonijah had for his assistants joab the captain of the army and abiathar the high priests and the only persons that opposed him were zadok the high priest and the prophet nathan and benaiah who was captain of the guards and shimei david's friend with all the other most mighty men now adonijah had prepared a supper out of the city near the fountain that was in the king's paradise and had invited all his brethren except solomon and had taken with him joab the captain of the army and abiathar and the rulers of the tribe of judah but had not invited to this feast either zadok the high priest nor nathan the prophet nor benaiah the captain of the guards nor any of those of the contrary party this matter was told by nathan the prophet to bathsheba solomon's mother that adonijah was king and that david knew nothing of it and he advised her to save herself and her son solomon and to go by herself to david and say to him that he had indeed sworn that solomon should reign after him and that in the meantime adonijah had already taken the kingdom he said that he the prophet himself would come after her and when she had spoken thus to the king would confirm what she had said accordingly bathsheba agreed with nathan and went in to the king and worshipped him and when she had desired leave to speak with him she told him all things in the manner that nathan had suggested to her and related what a supper adonijah had made and who they were whom he had invited abiathar and joab the general and david's sons excepting solomon and his intimate friends she had also said that all the people had their eyes upon him to know whom he would choose for their king she desired him also to consider how after his departure adonijah if he were king would slay 
her and her son Solomon. Now as Bathsheba was speaking, the keeper of the king's chambers told him that Nathan desired to see him. And when the king had commanded that he should be admitted, he came in and asked him whether he had ordained Adonijah to be king, and delivered the government to him or not, for that he had made a splendid supper, and invited all his sons except Solomon, as also that he had invited Joab the captain of the host, and Abiathar the high priest, who are feasting with applauses and many joyful sounds of instruments, and wish that his kingdom may last for ever. But he hath not invited me, nor Zadok the high priest, nor Benaiah the captain of the guards, and it is but fit that all should know whether this be done by thy approbation or not. When Nathan had said thus, the king commanded that they should call Bathsheba to him, for she had gone out of the room when the prophet came. And when Bathsheba was come, David said, I swear by the Almighty God that thy son Solomon shall certainly be king, as I formerly swore, and that he shall sit upon my throne, and that this very day also. So Bathsheba worshipped him and wished him a long life, and the king sent for Zadok the high priest, and Benaiah the captain of the guards, and when they were come he ordered them to take with them Nathan the prophet, and all the armed men about the palace, and to set his son Solomon upon the king's mule, and to carry him out of the city to the fountain called Gihon, and to anoint him there with the holy oil, and to make him king. This he charged Zadok the high priest, and Nathan the prophet, to do, and commanded them to follow Solomon through the midst of the city, and to sound the trumpets, and wish aloud that Solomon the king may sit upon the royal throne for ever, and so all the people may know that he is ordained king by his father. He also gave Solomon a charge concerning his government, to rule the whole nation of the Hebrews, and particularly the tribe of Judah, religiously and righteously. And when Benaiah had prayed to God to be favorable to Solomon, without any delay they set Solomon upon the mule, and brought him out of the city to the fountain, and anointed him with oil, and brought him into the city again, with acclamations and wishes that his kingdom might continue a long time. And when they had introduced him into the king's house, they set him upon the throne, whereupon all the people betook themselves to make merry, and to celebrate a festival, dancing and delighting themselves with musical pipes, till both the earth and the air echoed with the multitude of the instruments of music. Now when Adonijah and his guest perceived this noise, they were in disorder, and Joab the captain of the host said he was not pleased with these echoes and the sound of the trumpets. And when supper was set before them, nobody tasted of it, but they were all very thoughtful what would be the matter. Then Jonathan the son of Abiathar the high priest came running to them, and when Adonijah saw the young man gladly and said to him, that he was a good messenger. He declared to them the whole matter about Solomon and the determination of King David. Hereupon both Adonijah and the guests rose hastily from the feast, and every one fled to their own homes, Adonijah also, as afraid of the king for what he had done, became a supplicant to God, and took hold of the horns of the altar which were prominent. It was also told Solomon that he had so done, and that he desired to receive assurances from him that he would not remember the injury he had done, and not inflict any severe punishment for it. Solomon answered very mildly and prudently that he forgave him this his offense but said withal that if he were found out in any attempt for new innovations, 
that he would be the author of his own punishment. So he sent to him and raised him up from the place of his supplication. And when he was come to the king and had worshipped him, the king bid him go away to his own house and have no suspicion of any harm and desired him to show himself a worthy man as what would tend to his own advantage but david being desirous of ordaining his son king of all the people called together their rulers to jerusalem with the priests and the levites and having first numbered the levites he found them to be thirty-eight thousand from thirty years old to fifty out of which he appointed twenty-three thousand to take care of the building of the temple and out of the same six thousand to be judges of the people and scribes four thousand for porters to the house of god and as many for singers to sing to the instruments which david had prepared as we have said already he divided them into courses and when he had separated the priests from them he found of these priests twenty-four courses sixteen of the house of eleazar and eight of that of ithamar and he ordained that one course should minister to god eight days from sabbath to sabbath and thus were the courses distributed by lot in the presence of david and zadok and abiathar the high priests and of all the rulers, and that course which came up first was written down as the first, and accordingly the second, and so on to the twenty-fourth, and this partition hath remained to this day. He also made twenty-four parts of the tribe of Levi, and when they cast lots, they came up in the same manner for their courses of eight days. He also honored the posterity of Moses, and made them the keepers of the treasures of God, and of the donations which the kings dedicated. He also ordained that all the tribe of Levi, as well as the priests, should serve God night and day, as Moses had enjoined them. After this he parted the entire army into twelve parts, with their leaders and captains of hundreds and commanders. Now every part had twenty-four thousand, which were ordered to wait upon Solomon by thirty days at a time from the first day till the last, with the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. He also set rulers over every part, such as he knew to be good and righteous men. He set others also to take charge of the treasures and of the villages and of the fields and of the beasts whose names i do not think it necessary to mention when david had ordered all these officers after the manner before mentioned he called the rulers of the hebrews and their heads of tribes and the officers over the several divisions and those that were appointed over every work and every possession and standing upon a high pulpit he said to the multitude as follows, My brethren and my people, I would have you know that I intended to build a house for God and prepared a large quantity of gold and a hundred thousand talents of silver. But God prohibited me by the prophet Nathan because of the wars I had on your account and because my right hand was polluted with the slaughter of our enemies. But he commanded that my son who was to succeed me in the kingdom, should build a temple for him. Now therefore, since you know that of the twelve sons whom Jacob our forefather had, Judah was appointed to be king, and that I was preferred before my six brethren, and received the government from God, and that none of them were uneasy at it, so do I also desire that my sons be not seditious one against another. Now Solomon has received the kingdom, but to bear him cheerfully for their Lord, as knowing that God hath chosen him, for it is not a grievous thing to obey even a foreigner as a ruler, 
if it be God's will. But it is fit to rejoice when a brother hath obtained that dignity, since the rest partake of it with him. And I pray that the promises of God may be fulfilled, and that this happiness, which he hath promised to bestow upon King Solomon over all the country, may continue therein for all time to come. And these promises, O son, will be firm and come to a happy end if thou showest thyself to be a religious and a righteous man and an observer of the laws of thy country. But if not, expect adversity upon thy disobedience to them. Now when the king had said this, he left off, but gave the description and pattern of the building of the temple in the sight of them all to Solomon, of the foundations and of the chambers, inferior and superior, how many they were to be, and how large in height and in breadth, as also he determined the weight of the golden and silver vessels. Moreover, he earnestly excited them with his words to use the utmost alacrity about the work. He exhorted the rulers also, and particularly the tribe of Levi, to assist him, both because of his youth and because God had chosen him to take care of the building of the temple and of the government of the kingdom. He also declared to them that the work would be easy, and not very laborious to them, because he had prepared for it many talents of gold, and more of silver, with timber, and a great many carpenters and stone-cutters, and a large quantity of emeralds, and all sorts of precious stones. And he said, that even now he would give of the proper goods of his own dominion two hundred talents, and three hundred other talents of pure gold, for the most holy place, and for the chariot of God, the cherubim, which are to stand over and cover the ark. Now when David had done speaking, there appeared great alacrity among the rulers and the priests and the Levites, who now contributed and made great and splendid promises for a future contribution, for they undertook to bring of gold five thousand talents, and ten thousand drams, and of silver ten thousand talents, and many ten thousand talents of iron, and if any one had a precious stone, he brought it, and bequeathed it to be put among the treasures, of which Jekiel, one of the posterity of Moses, had the care. Upon this occasion all the people rejoiced, as in particular did David, when he saw the zeal and forward ambition of the rulers and the priests, and of all the rest, and he began to bless God with a loud voice, calling him the father and parent of the universe, and the author of human and divine things, with which he had adorned Solomon, the patron and guardian of the Hebrew nation, and of its happiness, and of that kingdom which he hath given his son. Besides this, he prayed for happiness to all the people, and to Solomon his son, a sound and a righteous mind, and confirmed in all sorts of virtue. And then he commanded the multitude to bless God, upon which they all fell down upon the ground and worshipped him. They also gave thanks to David on account of all the blessings which they had received ever since he had taken the kingdom. On the next day he presented sacrifices to God, a thousand bullocks, and as many lambs, which they offered for burnt offerings. They also offered peace offerings, and slew many ten thousand sacrifices. And the king feasted all day, together with all the people. And they anointed Solomon a second time with the oil, and appointed him to be king, and Zadok to be the high priest of the whole multitude. And when they had brought Solomon to the royal palace, and had set him upon his father's throne, they were obedient to him from that day. Chapter 15 
a charge David gave to his son Solomon at the approach of his death, and how many things he left him for the building of the temple. A little afterward David also fell into a distemper by reason of his age, and perceiving that he was near to death, he called his son Solomon and discoursed to him thus. I am now, O my son, going to my grave and to my father's, which is the common way which all men that now are, or shall be hereafter, must go, from which way it is no longer possible to return and to know anything that is done in this world. On which account I exhort thee, while I am still alive, though already very near to death, in the same manner as I have formerly said in my advice to thee, to be righteous towards thy subjects, and religious towards God, that hath given thee thy kingdom to observe his commands and his laws, which he hath sent us by Moses, and neither do thou out of favor nor flattery allow any lust or other passion to weigh with thee to disregard them, for if thou transgressest his laws, thou wilt lose the favor of God, and thou wilt turn away his providence from thee in all things. But if thou behave thyself so as it behooves thee, and as I exhort thee, thou wilt preserve our kingdom to our family, and no other house will bear rule over the Hebrews but we ourselves for all ages. Be thou also mindful of the transgressions of Joab, the captain of the host, who hath slain two generals out of envy, and those righteous and good men, Abner the son of Ner, and Amasa the son of Jether, whose death do thou avenge, as shall seem good to thee, since Joab hath been too hard for me and more potent than myself, and so hath escaped punishment hitherto. I also commit to thee the son of Barzillai the Gileadite, whom, in order to gratify me, thou shalt have in great honor, and take great care of, for we have not done good to him first, but we only repay that debt which we owe to his father for what he did to me in my flight. There is also Shimei the son of Gira, of the tribe of Benjamin, who, after he had cast many reproaches upon me, when in my flight I was going to Mahanaim, met me at Jordan, and received assurances that he should then suffer nothing. Do thou now seek out for some just occasion, and punish him. When David had given these admonitions to his son about public affairs, and about his friends, and about those whom he knew to deserve punishment, he died, having lived seventy years, and reigned seven years and six months in Hebron over the tribe of Judah, and thirty-three years in Jerusalem over all the country. This man was of an excellent character, and was endowed with all virtues that were desirable in a king, and in one that had the preservation of so many tribes committed to him, for he was a man of valor in a very extraordinary degree, and went readily and first of all into dangers when he was to fight for his subjects, as exciting the soldiers to action by his own labors, and fighting for them, and not by commanding them in a despotic way. He was also of very great abilities in understanding and apprehension of present and future circumstances when he was to manage any affairs. He was prudent and moderate and kind to such as were under any calamities. He was righteous and humane, which are good qualities peculiarly fit for kings, nor was he guilty of any offense in the exercise of so great an authority but in the business of the wife of Uriah. He also left behind him greater wealth than any other king, either of the Hebrews or of other nations, ever did. 
he was buried by his son solomon in jerusalem with great magnificence and with all the other funeral pomp which kings used to be buried with moreover he had great and immense wealth buried with him the vastness of which may be easily conjectured at by what i shall now say for a thousand and three hundred years afterward hyrcanus the high priest when he was besieged by antiochus that was called the pious the son of demetrius and was desirous of giving him money to get him to raise the siege and draw off his army and having no other method of compassing the money opened one room of david's sepulchre and took out three thousand talents and gave part of that sum to antiochus and by this means caused the siege to be raised as we have informed the reader elsewhere nay after him and that many years herod the king opened another room and took away a great deal of money and yet neither of them came at the coffins of the kings themselves for their bodies were buried under the earth so artfully that they did not appear to even those that entered into their monuments but so much shall suffice us to have said concerning these matters End of Book 7, Chapters 14 and 15 End of Book 7 Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas, USA